Boston College under Steve Adazio, staying on that uh, seven-win trend. Uh, we'll see what happens here in 2019. We got a sneak peek into the current uh, Eagles uh, as they wrapped up their spring session with their annual spring game. We got uh, Dan Rubin on the line from Eagles Unlimited. Folks, if you've just been watching Mark Rogers TV, the voice of college football recently, not familiar with Dan, one of my first guests and contributors. Dan, how you doing? Hey, it's uh, the sun's shining. Well, it was. Now it's raining because it's New England and the weather changes hour to hour up here. I'm not far but away. I'm still so not, I'm I'm still not going to complain, though. Yeah, still can't complain, though, about it, though, because it's 60 degrees out and, and beautiful. So you didn't get to play this bowl game. I'd, I'd like to get your thoughts on that. If there are any thoughts, you didn't get to play. I, that's pretty unfortunate. That's kind of a freak thing that almost never happens. I don't know when the last time in postseason history that a game was not played, but I was really amped up to see uh, what is an unusual matchup between Boise State and Boston College. Yeah, we were all excited about it. We, uh, I, I planned a whole day around it, took the day off of work, planned a whole day with my friends the day after Christmas, took care, took care of the Christmas Sunday scaries and said, you know what, let's, let's postpone, go back to work for a day. Whole day. We all got together. There were ten of us watching the game, and then the lightning came. From what I understand, it was a, uh, it was, it wasn't even a, a traditional Texas lightning storm. It was a Texas-sized Texas lightning storm uh, that that wiped it out, and the, the game got canceled in the first in the first quarter. Uh, BC was winning, so I'd like to think that BC won the bowl game by virtue of the game getting canceled in the first quarter. But you know what? It was a, it was an unfortunate thing, and if nothing else, it. Uh, it, ru it robbed us and ruined our day of having a, a, a really, really fun day of watching football and the uh, and torpedo today with with my friends, which we salvaged it. We we salvaged it uh, well, sure by watching. Did. I think yeah, I, I think we started watching. I think we started watching like Rocky Two or something, but we salvaged it. Uh, I will say that uh, maybe you can take credit for a prorated win. Maybe your record last year was 7.1 in five or something like that. We yeah, can do that. We'll roll with that. So I like that. Dan Rubin on the line from Eagles Unlimited. Dan has joined me for a number of years talking Boston College football. One of the programs that actually I know, and I don't think I will offend Dan in saying this, this program has put a lot of people to sleep both on and off the field in regards to it's not the sexiest brand in college football. But for me, I'm intrigued by turning the 65th rated recruiting classes into seven win football teams. I'm always intrigued by that. And uh, the 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 two and three stars that are able to play with the Florida States and Clemson's and play them pretty tough. And uh, you, you've got another brand and another version of that uh, coming up this fall. Yep. The, uh, I'll tell you, you know, the, the big thing when it comes to Boston college is that it's not so everyone, I know everyone likes the recruiting numbers and, and recruiting rankings. And I do, I mean, I do too, when they, when they get announced or when they, when, when you see the, the national signing day, I always love the kind of the new pageantry of it. Um, the, you know, it's, it's almost like free agency in, in the NFL where these guys are committing and, and their parents and every families are so excited. So for me, it's always an exciting time, but, at Boston College, you're not necessarily going to get the same type of pageantry. You get your own type of pageantry when it comes to recruiting, which is they're going to do things a little bit differently, and they're going to do things a little bit um, – I wouldn't use the term moneyballish like the Oakland A's, but certain types of players and certain types of recruits go to Boston College, and, and they take these guys who are very raw, maybe overlooked by certain measurables, and they turn them into – football players by virtue of conditioning, strength, training, development, the player development system that's in place and has been for, for decades here with, with a couple of dips and uh, peaks and valleys type of thing. So it's really exciting when, especially the springtime, when you start to see some of these guys who came in were very raw, maybe undersized, maybe needed to drop a little bit of weight, and you start to see them develop into football players because this is the time when they're really hitting the turf. We know – the commodities, the known commodities. It wasn't always like this for the last, you know, last six or seven years. But they come in this spring with a lot of known commodities, and you start to see the development phase come in on new players, guys who wound up starring throughout the spring. And on Saturday, had a heck of a day in the spring game, which you know, the spring game I know elsewhere is a celebration. It was just as big a celebration at BC with fans out and enjoying it, and maybe trying to see AJ Dillon lay a stiff arm down, which he didn't do because he didn't play, but it was still a good chance to see some of these depth guys and, 
and guys who you're not going to see in the fall star on the gridiron. Mark Rogers TV, the voice of college football, bringing you some Boston College talk, uh, courtesy Dan Rubin. You can join him on Eagles Unlimited. Dan is headed to the Frozen Four, where he is uh, covering uh, a little bit of hockey as uh, he dives into uh, throughout the winter. Uh, two of those positional units in which that development system will be put to the test this year is, of course, an offensive line that many would be surprised to know was the most experienced in the ACC. And I'm not just talking about guys that hung around for four years and got some starts, but I'm talking about experienced and talented and productive offensive line. And then also a secondary that uh, featured uh, one of the top uh, theft uh, guys in the secondary among defensive backs, Hamp Cheevers, Will Harris, uh, Lucas Dennis, uh, just an experienced and very talented uh, secondary. So those would be the two units that stand out to me that you really need to supplement. Yeah, absolutely. And, and there, I mean, we're not running from it either. Uh, you know, the the realization that Boston College needs to replace a, a whole lot along the front uh, front line and, and back in the defensive backfield. So we start off the top just by saying um, some of the guys that are gone, you're starting entire left side of the line is gone and you're centered because um, John Baker came back as a red shirt after a medical red shirt. He started as the center on the team. He's, um, I'm sorry, Baker might have been gone two years ago. Uh, that always clips me a little bit, but we'll focus on the left side of the line. Chris Lindstrom, the left guard, Aaron Montero, the left tackle. So when they came into BC, Montero was about 35 pounds heavier than he wanted to be. Chris Lindstrom actually did was smaller than the defensive lineman he was lining up against. So when you have a, a, a tackle who's six foot four, 350, 360 pounds as a freshman lining up next to a guard who is six foot two, six foot three, 275 pounds as a as a freshman and played as true freshman. To see the way that they developed and graduated last year and, and finished out their career, those were the guys who really started the process of putting the stop gap and started during that 2015 season that, you know, people would look back and say, oh, that was when Boston College had the worst offense in Division One, but had the best defense in Division One. How does that happen? Well, that's exactly it. They had to play freshmen who are either way too oversized and weren't in football shape or guys who are undersized and weren't in football shape. So those guys graduate last year. And Chris Lindstrom, actually, if you if you if you you're watching the NFL draft, he's gonna be a name to watch because they're because his NFL combine was out of this world. He was great. So he's going to be a, a sleeper name to watch in the draft first or second round. I've seen him in, in a couple of projections for the first, but that's another story for another day. So now those guys are gone. You've lost them. You've lost, I believe, a, a couple of other players along the line too. And now you're, you're replacing that with your depth, which came in maybe two years later. So Lindstrom, Montero, they played 2015, 2016, 2017. You're bringing in a new crop of guys which includes guys like Ben Petrula, guys like Anthony Palazzolo, guys like Alec Lindstrom, who was a freshman last year, Chris's brother, who come in and don't have to play right away. And if they did play back in 2017 in Petrula's place, were out of position maybe. Petrula was recruited as a tackle. He wound up playing at center when John Baker went down, which actually is why Baker's name popped back into my head as a fifth-year uh, fifth guy last year in 2018, or sixth year, I want to say. But nevertheless... Um, so now you have these guys who have come in, have trained for a year or two underneath, in some cases had to play, so you don't have game experience. But this is now that system in place where you say, okay, we've had guys who've played for four years. These other guys are in the back. When these guys leave, you can now slot these other guys back in underneath, which was the Boston College system back in the glory years of the 2000s, back into 99 when they were O-line U. Similarly, you have that in the defensive backfield. Hamp Cheevers, Will Harris, Lucas Dennis, those are all guys that played a lot of snaps. They're gone, so now you're bringing in guys who maybe don't have the in-game experience that those other guys had, but have been in the system. Guys like Brandon Sebastian, who did play last year, Mike Palmer, who did play last year some, but obviously didn't start or, or play the full amount, and guys like Tate Haynes, who – actually had a, a fumble recovery for a touchdown in the uh, in the spring game on Saturday. But Tate Haynes, who was an athlete recruited, a guy, again, three stars, a very raw guy who, could, who was recruited as both a defensive back and a quarterback, shifts to play cornerback full time. He's the type of guy who can come out, make some plays, and really, I think, surprise a lot of people. So 
I'm getting wordy. There's a lot of analysis in there. The bottom line is you have a system that you now need to start trusting, which is some guys leave, new guys come in. You're now in the cycle of college football, which takes six years to put together. So, you know, 2015, all that's happening. 2013, 2014, Steve Adazio is building it out. Now here we are in 2019, and finally you can start seeing the fruits of those labors. Dan, you can be wordy. I miss you. Like having you on here. So you get on here, you can uh, have free reign. No issues there. I'm okay with it. So I know you're okay with it. You can talk. <laughs> so uh, this comes to mind. I think there must be a mandate or some kind of a legislation that's been passed, according to Boston College Football under Steve Adazio. If you go six and six, you have to win the bowl game. If you go seven and five, you lose the bowl game. Seven and six, seven and six, seven and six. You had the three and nine aberration in there. But Steve Adazio, I'll credit him with... Um, basically bringing this same level of team to the table each and every year. And you're talking about cycling players. When do you hit that cycle? You hear about this in baseball among, among mid-level market teams that can't compete every year. But if they catch the right cycle, put the right team together for a year or two, they can take their shot. Do you foresee being able to catch that? And Clemson's an aberration. Uh, but under normal circumstances, being able to take that division championship type shot. Oh, abs absolutely. Um, you know, I, I really believe it was there last year. And, and and then there was problems towards the end of the year. A.J. Dillon hurt his ankle during the season. So that lightning in a bottle with him the second year, we'll call it a sophomore slump if you want. Um, he, he deals with that. They didn't really develop the depth at running back. So when A.J. goes down, they either had to change the way that they were running or change the way that they were thinking a little bit offensively, which when you're doing that with personnel who are geared to play a certain way and you have to start shifting and molding your style on the fly, you're going to you're gonna take shots and miss. Um, Anthony Brown is back, so you have that whole kind of conduit, the, the, the freshmen or the, the guys who came in together as freshmen, the running backs and the, the quarterbacks and the skill position guys who are still there. So I think that – Assuming that the transition is going to go well with the defensive backfield and the offensive line, that that's just going to move forward, that the defensive line, you'll replace Zach Allen, you'll replace uh, Wyatt Ray, the linebackers all, for the most part, come back, Connor Strahan's gone, but the, the most of the most of the personnel are back that, that played, you can take your shot. And I think last year, um, I'm not going to say that Anthony Brown getting hurt cost BC a win against Clemson by any stretch, but you had hosted college game day. You were within a game of winning the Atlantic division. And then your quarterback goes down when you're up, when you're up by a touchdown, seven to nothing on Clemson at home on a punt return. And from there, it, that is, that's like you're here. And then instead of going up, you plateaued and shot down. So I think there's a good opportunity in there. Uh, but they still have to go out and take it. So I think that that is, they are very much aware of that. And they are very much aware that they tasted some success last year. But now it's a question of sustaining it. Each year you take another step. So you've gone, we've we rebuilt, we became a bowl team, figured out how to win a bowl game when they beat Maryland, figured out how to get to the next tier of a bowl game. And now the next step is getting some success. Well, they've had some success. How do you sustain it? because that Atlantic division might be a little bit more wide open than you think Clemson, notwithstanding. And, and you, you stole my thunder there because I was going to uh, bring that to realization of the situation that took place when Clemson played Boston college, that uh, it seems unreasonable now. And in no way, I don't believe Dan or myself are comparing Clemson and Boston college no. uh, as football teams on the field, but there was the opportunity only trailing by one game in the division with Clemson at home. You win that game. You win the tiebreaker. You play the final two games of the season against uh, Florida State and against Syracuse with a chance to run the table and win the division. Remarkably, as ridiculous as that sounds, and you had a 7 to nothing lead and you had your quarterback in play, he was taken out. And it wasn't a close game, but it was not a... 27 to seven game. That's the final score, but it was 17, seven. It was in that range, just hanging there for quite some time. And again, restricted by the limited play of the backup quarterback. There was 
a window of opportunity there that that intrigues me. And of course, that's last season and has has gone by us. Uh, the last thing I'll hit you with, Dan, here, as we look toward 2019, who are some of the guys? And you probably mentioned some of them, but one or two, three players, whatever you want to choose that uh, kind of excite you that we may not know a whole lot about right now. Well, everybody's going to talk about A.J. Dillon, and rightfully so, at running back. I think that's a given. I think he's your your workhorse, and and realistically, you're going as far as, as he can as he can take you. And, and But I think Anthony Brown is going to develop as a quarterback. Anthony Brown put together quietly one of the best statistical seasons in Boston College program history, and there's still going to be a lot of complaints about him because it, it the numbers, sometimes you watch him and he needed to be a little bit more consistent. I think if he becomes more consistent and he actually improves on the numbers, his numbers are floating up there into the Glenn Foley, Matt Ryan territory, just as a, just as a, for an argument's sake. He might actually finish with numbers that are along those lines, and he's only a junior. So he's one name. I really like Ben Glines, who's a guy who at the beginning of last season, I didn't think too highly of. I'll readily admit it. He shocked me with the way he came out and, and supplanted A.J. Dillon when he was hurt. He's a, a hard-nosed, physical guy, loves himself some contact. He's he's not a bruiser, but he plays like one, uh, can do whatever you ask of him. Um, I didn't think he was the best football player, and then I saw what he could do, and I saw his tenacity, and, and now he's probably one of my favorite players on the team. And the other name that I'll throw in there is David Bailey. He had 100-something yards and a touchdown against Louisville last year, was a 250-pound running back last year, who lost 10 pounds in the offseason and put it on in muscle. So that of that 250, he went down on the scale to 240 but became a lot muscular. He ripped off a 30-yard touchdown run on Saturday in the in the spring game. And, and he's the type of guy where he's built a lot like A.J. Dillon. So he's a, he's a name that you want to at least keep tabs on. Uh, defensively, I'll just throw out there that I think Tate Haynes is going gonna, is gonna to really have a breakout. And, and I'm really excited to see what he can do as a defensive back because I think – He's going to be a, a name to really watch opposite another guy who didn't really play this spring as he was coming back from an injury. Uh, Jason Matry, local product out of Everett, Massachusetts, uh, Everett High School. I think he I think he moved down to Florida after he graduated high school. Uh, his family moved because his hometown says Orlando. Uh, but he's a name that, you know, he, every 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 few years, BC tends to get one of those Everett High School guys in Massachusetts, and they come in. Lucas Dennis was one. Um, you know, they come in and for whatever reason, one of those guys always tends to, to break out and you're like, Hey, I've been watching this guy since he was 13 years old and that was pretty darn good. All right. Talking BC, wrapping up the spring with a uh, Dan Rubin from Eagles unlimited. Uh, Dan, you're always welcome. Of course, you know that, uh, good luck and, uh, happy trails onto the frozen four. Hey, I'm uh, Buffalo bound and we'll see who crowns a national champion this weekend. <laughs> 